Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala amma ba'd. Let me get straight to the point. How does one navigate one's way through the maze of modern controversies? I want to give some guidelines. Obviously, in a 10 15 minute lecture, we have no time to go into details. But if we look at a number of incidents of early Islam, we get an idea of some of the guidelines we need to follow in order to be rightly guided. In a hadith narrated in Abu Dawood, a group of Sahaba went out on an expedition. And in the course of the army, in the course of the war, one of them had a severe wound in his head, fractured skull, open wound in the skull. And on the way back, he was sick, he was lying in bed, uh, he was like basically wounded. On the way back, he becomes Junub. And he wakes up in the state of Janaba, and the question arises, I need to pray Fajr. Do I have to do ghusl with an open wound on my head? Still bleeding wound on my head, freezing cold weather. The desert uh, is a very cold place at night in the, in the winter. Do I have to do ghusl and perhaps fester the wound or not? And there was no person of knowledge in that gathering. And so one of the Sahaba said, you know, the Quran clearly says you have to do, you have to do ghusl. And I just don't see any exception for you when you have a wound. So what if you have a wound? So the Sahabi took a bath with an open wound. And of course, the wound festered. Of course, his situation got worse and he passed away. He died as a result of that infected wound in the head. When the Prophet ﷺ heard, of this, he said, They killed him. May Allah's curse be on them. They killed him. May Allah's curse be on them. Now, Allah, I translate as may Allah's curse, but inshallah, it doesn't mean the Prophet himself said that when I get angry at another Muslim, Allah changes my curse uh, into a forgiveness or blessing. That I'm a human being and sometimes I'll curse a Muslim and it's out of anger and, Allah, and I have a promise with Allah. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, I have a promise with Allah that if I ever curse another believer, it'll be transformed into a blessing and an istighfar for him. So he got so angry, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that they gave a fatwa that was wrong and it resulted in his death. So he said, qataluhu qatalahum Allah. Then he said, why didn't they ask the fatwa? Why didn't they ask a person of knowledge when they were ignorant? Verily, the cure to ignorance is asking questions. The cure to ignorance is to ask questions. And this hadith shows us the dangers of overzealousness, the dangers of religious fanaticism, which is all too common amongst some segments of the ummah. All MSAs have that brother, you know what I'm talking about, or that sister. Will be gender free in this lecture, mashallah. Because, yeah, you got fanatics on both genders. Where they make Islam so difficult, so impossible, that in reality, nobody can live their lives like that. And the fact of the matter, and take it from me, brothers and sisters, I have been in the MSA and involved with the MSA for the last 25 years. And I have seen too many of these cases. Brothers or sisters that are overzealous, over fanatic, they burn out. And you meet these same people 10, 15, 20 years down the line and you're shocked like, what, you, brother, what, what happened? Complete 180. Because you cannot sustain a life with such religious fanaticism. With everything becoming difficult or haram or whatnot. And we see over here as well. Here was a person, he read the Quran. The Quran clearly says, when you're in a state of janaba, do ghusl. It's in the Quran. So the man thought, you know what? Tough luck, he's going to have to do ghusl. And based on that presumption, it led to a person's death. And this person didn't realize for every rule there are exceptions. For every verse there are clauses to get out. For every hadith, for every am there's a khas. For every general there's a specific. The person had no idea. But in his zealousness to be Islamic, to be Quranic, to be following the tradition, he went against the tradition. We all have people like that. Another incident shows us the exact opposite side. 
in the time of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, a, a person who had a lot of, not knowledge, he, he was known for his services to the community. He was a person who had a lot of good in him, but he wasn't a scholar. He hadn't studied Islam. Well-known person in the community who actually had fought certain battles with the Prophet as well. So he has a stellar CV, okay, but not knowledge. This particular individual in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, not in the time of the Prophet in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, he read a verse in the Quran, it's in Surah Al-Ma'idah, it's still there. And Allah says in the Quran, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِيمَا طَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ There is no sin on anyone regarding anything they eat and drink as long as they're righteous and they believe in Allah and they do good. That's the verse in the Quran. So this particular individual said, Aha! Clearly the Quran allows drinking alcohol. I'm not making this up. This is a famous historic incident in early Islam. He took one verse, which is ambiguous, it's open to interpretation, and he used it as a trump card against every single other verse, every hadith, the unanimous consensus of the Sahaba. That became secondary. The verse clearly says that anything is halal to eat and drink, as long as I have iman and taqwa. Now, footnote here, Allah clearly says, as long as you have iman and taqwa and do good, i.e., as long as you follow Islamic law, everything that's halal is halal for you to eat. I.e., don't feel guilty, don't feel bad. When Allah has made things halal, then enjoy them. That's the meaning of the verse. No one ever understood it that everything is halal. Pig becomes halal, alcohol becomes halal. Nobody, the verse is not talking like that. But this particular individual basically said, the verse clearly says, and he ignored other verses, other ahadith, the unanimous consensus. And this led to an interpretation as well that was rejected by every sahabi, every other person alive. Nobody agreed with him. In fact, when he was brought in front of Umar ibn al-Khattab, drunk, and he tried to use this verse, said, look, it's allowed for me. Umar ibn al-Khattab did not accept his excuse and punished him for the, the, the sin of drinking, the 80 lashes, punished him. Because this is not a legitimate interpretation. This is not within the spectrum of acceptable interpretation of Islam. Even if the person thinks he has a verse, the methodology, we call it in Arabic, usul, that he used to derive this verdict are absolutely nonsensical. They don't really exist. And it wasn't used as an excuse. Now what this shows us, my dear brothers and sisters, is that from the beginning of time, we've had ultra-fanaticism, and we'd have ultra-liberalism. We've had these strains, but they've always been peripheries of the ummah. They've always been at the fringe. And the bulk of the ummah, the bulk of the Muslim scholars, the bulk of Islam has always been within these two extremes. And therefore, dear brothers and sisters, one of the primary ways to navigate through the problems of our times, the controversies of our times, is to ignore the extremist voices on both sides and to concentrate on what the Prophet called the sawadul a'zam or the, the bulk of the ummah. Our Prophet said, my ummah shall never unite upon misguidance. The Prophet said, my ummah is an ummah that is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, I command you, I advise you to follow the jama'ah, the large group of Muslims. And whoever breaks away, breaks away leading to the fire of hell. So when you look at Islamic scholarship, Alhamdulillah, we can clearly say that from the beginning of time, there's been a spectrum of permissibility, a spectrum of opinions that scholars have held, and then there are fringes that by and large have been rejected by the, uh, by the ummah. And therefore, when we're navigating through any modern controversy, look at who is giving that fatwa. Look at that person's track record. Look at the person's credibility. Look at the person's peers. Look at the person's acceptance in the ummah. All of these are signs in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these are, 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 are basically methods you can use to, to, to gauge the veracity, the authenticity of an opinion. And therefore, I always advise my brothers and sisters that, you know, we're living at times of pseudo-scholarship. We're living at times where people without knowledge but the sharp tongue are assumed to be scholars. 
people who have the gift of the gab, people who know how to mesmerize audiences but have never studied the sharia. They don't have authentic scholarship. Unfortunately, the average Muslim sometimes gets confused. And everyone in this audience needs to educate himself or herself about authentic Islamic scholarship versus pseudo-scholarship. Somebody who watches a few YouTube videos doesn't become an alim. Somebody who Googles a, a, a fatwa doesn't become a mufti. Somebody who just reads a Wikipedia entry on something doesn't become an expert on it. We wouldn't do this for any other discipline. Would you go to a doctor who's merely studied from Google and Wikipedia? No. So then why is your religion cheaper than your life? Why is your house, you would not go except to an architect to design your house. Why is your house or your, or your life not as important even as your religion? For religious scholarship as well, there are institutions, there are people, there are bona fide accreditations, there are people who have that authentic scholarship. And it is your job, because on the day of judgment, Allah will ask you about what you did. It is your job to search for authentic Islamic scholarship. And alhamdulillah, there's a spectrum of opinion and understand and tolerate. You can choose your position within that spectrum. There are opinions that alhamdulillah, I might have something. Imam Suhaib might have something else. Imam others might have something. This is within the spectrum. You'll find the classical differences. But there are also opinions that go beyond the spectrum of acceptability. And that is where... That is where I ask you to think a little bit more critically. And the other point I have, and then inshallah, I'll hand it over to my dear colleague and, and friend, Imam Suhaib Webb. Uh, the, other, the other point that I, that I have is that I speak especially to you in college or who have studied over here, second generation and third generation American Muslims. Just as you're brave enough to question Islam and to question scholars and to question why is this haram, why is this halal, be just as brave, if not braver, to question your own paradigm from within which those questions are emanating. I.e., just like you're saying, why should this be haram? Why did Allah prohibit this? And you want to ask these questions, as well, be brave enough to challenge the dominant narrative that we have all been born into. To be brave enough to challenge the mainstream understandings because morality and ethics in the Western environment evolves over time. Whereas in the Islamic tradition, morality and ethics is something that is stable. And we need to be cognizant enough of the effects of being born at a particular time, in a particular society, in a particular culture, in a particular civilization. And the fact that that automatically causes us to absorb values through osmosis, through interaction, some of those values might not be authentic, might not be Islamic, and some of them might be. Question the questions just as much or even more than you're willing to question the Islamic tradition. And for this field in particular, there are many disciplines, but in particular, postmodernism really is a great field for college students to understand that if you really go down this route, there is no haram and halal, there are no ethics. If you're going to go down this route of, of pure liberalism and pure following the dominant trend, then everything becomes permissible. And this is something that you can point out as well. Uh, I mean, again, just to give you some examples. So one of the things we're taught is to be tolerant, to be liberal, to accept differences of opinion. And we think this is the dominant narrative and it is appropriate. Very well, somebody comes along and let's just say politely, questions the morality of alternative lifestyles, if you understand my point. Questions the morality of alternative lifestyles. You understand what I'm referencing here. That person, all of a sudden becomes the bigot. Where did tolerance go? I thought you told us we should be tolerant of other opinions. A person who doesn't approve of particular lifestyles is equated to a racist. People lose their jobs these days. People have to resign. Famous CEOs for supporting certain issues, again, not wanting to get into the actual issue on this platform, I've done that yesterday in other platforms, people have had to resign simply for supporting historical institutions for, for millennia, but because they didn't agree to new, updated understandings of morality, of family. Where did the tolerance go that this society prides itself on? If you're only going to be tolerant to those whom you approve of, that's not tolerance.
That's not tolerance. I mean, a simple example here, right? The, 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 a person who does not approve of that alternative lifestyle, right? Look at how society judged the recent Ashley Madison scandal. All of you are familiar with the Ashley Madison scandal, okay? Look at how society felt that, oh, those people, how, how bad, how evil, cheating on their spouses and, 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 and finding partners you know, outside of marriage. Now, hold on a sec. According to your paradigm that you taught me and you taught us, consenting adults should be able to do whatever they want. Isn't that the paradigm you taught us? That if they're consensual and nobody else is harmed, then go ahead and do whatever you want. Who are you to judge other people? Well, then why did you judge Ashley Madison's people? Why did you judge the people on that website? We see clear double standards over and over and over again. Because the fact of the matter is, as Allah says in the Quran, if you're going to follow the whims of mankind, they will lead you astray. Morality is not decided by majority. Morality is not decided by majority. Allah clearly says in the Quran, If you were to follow the majority of people, they will misguide you from the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to be critical enough to engage with the questions that come. And as well, let me give you one final example, then I'll hand it over inshallah to uh, uh, Imam Suhaib. Simple, simple reality. I have been asked at least a hundred times by young men and women, more than a hundred times, that one of the biggest controversies that causes doubt in their faith are very trivial issues in the grand scale of things. For example, the, 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 the age of Aisha radiallahu anha when the Prophet married her. This is used by Islamophobes to smear our Prophet They call him vulgar terms, which I am even embarrassed to say about my Prophet on stage. They call him vulgar terms because he married a young lady. Aisha was young when this marriage took place. According to all books of Sirah, all authentic hadith, she was a young lady. And other Islamophobes say, look at this, astaghfirullah, yani man that he did this and that and, and, and married a young lady. And our Brothers and sisters are confused, like, how do we defend the Prophet I don't think that's ethically right, what he did. But this question is so easy to respond to. The reason why we are so certain it is unethical and immoral is because the times have changed. And we are back projecting our standards of ethical and moral law onto 7th century Arabia. For the bulk of human history, marriages took place at young ages. Look at the king and queens of Europe when they would intermarry with one another. They would get married sometimes as infants and toddlers and the marriage would be consummated at the age of 9, 10, 11, 12. The marriage laws of this own country of ours in every state a hundred years ago, marriage law, the age of marriage was in the early teens, 11, 12, 13. Some states to this day, 14 is the lowest age of getting married. For the bulk of human history, people have been getting married earlier than now. Why? Because people biologically and mentally matured faster back then. Too much responsibility. They didn't have the luxuries you guys have of Xboxes and iPhones and iPads and this and that. They matured. They had to work. They had to take care of themselves. Because of that, intellectually and biologically, a 13-year-old of 100 years ago is not a 13-year-old of today. And this is a fact. Shakespeare, when he wrote Romeo and Juliet, look this up, I'm not making this up, look it up. When he wrote Romeo and Juliet, do you know the ages of Romeo and Juliet in the actual play, 500 years ago? 14 and 13. Romeo is 14 years old. Juliet is 13 or 12. These are the actors that played Romeo and Juliet. In other words, 500 years ago, 14 and 13 was the equivalent of our 18 and 17 or 19 and 18. If this is 500 years ago, back project 1,400 years ago. Aisha radiallahu anha never complained that she got married at a young age. She was the happiest, the luckiest lady alive. Now somebody comes along and back projects our standards of morality. Nobody is saying we need to resurrect that now. Nobody is saying a, a, a young girl of our time, 9, 10, 11, should be married. I understand, times have changed. But my own grandmother, my own grandmother, Born in British India in the turn, at the turn of the century. She got married at the age of 14. And I was a teenager when I found out. And I was like, Daddy, how? 14? How could you get married at the age of 14? 
And she was like, you know, better sab log, everybody got married at that age, right? Every, all of my peers got married at that age. It's the, you guys think it's weird. This is my own grandmother. This is not like a thousand years ago. So for us to assume, oh my God, how evil, how immoral that the Prophet ﷺ married Aisha when he was young. You know, we need to question the question. We need to contextualize our own problems rather than projecting modern problems onto a, a system and a culture of 14 centuries ago. And again, Islam doesn't require uh, young girls to get married, but it was something that was allowed and permissible. Even the worst enemies of the Prophet did not find anything problematic. Abu Bakr did not find this problematic. Aisha didn't find it problematic. Why are we problematizing something that was never a problem? The problem is making it into a problem. It's not actually a problem. And the same goes for so many other questions. So these are the two points I want to leave you with. Number one, study your tradition. Learn your knowledge. If you're not going to become an alim, don't remain a jahil. If you're not going to become an alim, don't remain a jahil. Study something. Learn from scholars. Be connected to the ulama. Know who the ulama are and listen to their, their experiences and their wisdom. And number two, question your own tradition as well. Not the Islamic tradition. The tradition you happen to be born into, the dominant narrative, the values of liberalism and, and, and whatnot. You know, there are critics. There are critics from within the system that point out where this is going to lead. Nietzsche himself, in, in his famous book that he talks about the death of God, read that famous passage. He himself predicts that if you're going to eliminate God from the picture, there is no more morality. There is no up, there is no down, there is no left, there is no right. I.e., if you're going to eliminate God, everything goes, life becomes meaningless. And this is a true point, that if you're going to remove the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's left? And this is where, unfortunately, this is all heading. So these are my two points, brothers and sisters. Learn your tradition and then question the other tradition as well. And that is the tradition we happen to be born into. And then the final point, always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That's not a joke, brothers and sisters. That ayah is supposed to be recited more than 20 times a day. إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Always ask Allah for hidayah. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi himself, and he was the Prophet. He used to make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, show me the truth as truth and allow me to follow it. And so show me evil as evil and take me away from it. Imagine if he was making that dua. Where do I stand? Where do you stand? Make sure we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ آمين. وَجَزَاكُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ